Hello, friends. Welcome to the uh, Eucharistic Penance Seminar webinar. My name is Dan Burke, and I'm here with Dr. Peter Kwasniewski and Janet Smith. And we're going to, before we jump in and talk about Dr. Kwasniewski's fantastic book, The Holy Bread of Eternal Life, published by Sophia Institute Press, we're going to open up with a prayer for the intercession of the Blessed Mother. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tua in, milierbio, in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. So just to introduce us, for, for the, I would be shocked if our audience didn't know uh, uh, Peter or Janet, but my name is Dan Burke. I'm the president of the Avila Foundation, the Avila Institute for Spiritual Formation. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski is a Thomistic theologian, liturgical scholar, and composer, and the author of a book we're going to talk about today, which is a fantastic book, The Holy Bread of Eternal Life, Restoring Eucharistic Reverence in an Age of Impiety. And then Dr. Janet Smith, a well-known troublemaker, I mean moral theologian, recently uh, from Sacred Heart Major <laughs> Seminary in Detroit. Uh, Janet is most known for uh, her vociferous defense of uh, Humanae Vitae and, and uh, her great work in defending the faith uh, in the church for a long time. And I'm there, uh, Dr. Kwasniewski and, and, and Dr. Smith are both heroes of mine, so it's, a, it's an absolute blessing to, to spend some time with them talking about what I think is the most important issue of our time. Uh, and since I'm not a theologian, I have to be careful. I have to make sure I couch all my comments as questions more than statements. But uh, I wonder, as we open this up, when, after I had COVID in March, it was, a, it was a deeply traumatic time. I was very close to death because I have a chronic lung issues and I was already very sick. When I came out, I came. It was almost like a spiritual experience, and I, and I was already, you know, very traditional in my views in terms of liturgy in the church, and you know, our whole foundation is based on reproposing preconciliar mystical uh, the, theology and wisdom. So I was already rooted there, but as I exited, something that just struck me that I had never thought about before, and I w I'd like to get both of your reactions to this. And that is that it is true that the most, I, I, the most grave moral evil on the human plane is in our time is abortion in terms of proportionality and the number of children that are killed. But what struck me is I came to the conclusion that the most grave evil in our time, in my opinion, is, uh, is sacrilege, desecration uh, against the Lord in the Eucharist, a liturgical abuse. Am I crazy is that what do you guys think of that um no I, I i actually think very much along the same lines dan um because in the holy eucharist we're not dealing with a mere sign or symbol if we were uh then sinning against it would still be grave but it wouldn't be such a big deal as sinning against the lord himself who is really truly substantially present in the blessed sacrament um and so recovering a sense of wonder and amazement, Eucharistic amazement, as John Paul II said, at this miracle and this mystery and this and the majesty of our Lord present in the Eucharist is, that's crucial. That's absolutely crucial because if we're sinning against the Lord in the Eucharist, we're, we're, we're sinning against our final end. We're sinning against the ultimate goal that we're, that of all of creation and of our own lives. Um, and, and that's something that's, that's on a scale, really, that we can't compare to any natural evil. That's a supernatural evil. Janet, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. It's, it's a, it's a um, tantalizing thought. I remember years ago, uh, Bud McFarland Sr., who uh, became a great spokesperson against contraception, said that he had a vision at mass one day that um, contraception and unworthy reception. Are you, uh, looks like Janet froze up, Doc. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you, you said contraception and unworthy reception, Janet, and then you, uh, you froze. Uh, 
yet. I, I think just because the picture freezes, it doesn't mean the voice does. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, so anyway, I, he he said that he had this vision that that using contraception, which is again a, 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 a and an unworthy reception of the Eucharist, were very similar because you're taking this great gift of God and um, uh, violating it, uh, not. Um, not living in accord with his will for um, the intimacy of sexuality and not living in accord with his will for the intimacy, the worthy way of receiving the intimacy of, of the Eucharist. Um, and I, I mean, I agree with what uh, Peter was saying is, is very um, insightful that it, it both are both abortion and the body of Christ are unworthily receiving it are, um, defamations of bodies that have a kind of a, a I mean, the baby, a baby has an immortal soul. So there's a kind of a, a desecration of, of, of the holy, in a sense, in, in both of those. You're killing something that's meant to be, to be life, life or life giving. Janet, regarding your personal journey, of course, I, I've known about you from before I even converted to Catholicism with respect to your work with Humana Vitae. But I'm I'm not aware of your own journey in liturgy. Have, have you always? I know you're, you. I more recently I've seen you out there talking about and wrestling with these ideas that were that that uh, Peter covers in his book. But uh, have you gone through? What has your evolution been like? It it's been amazing. It it uh, is very much a. It, I grew up with the Latin Mass, all right, mm -hmm. until I was fifteen or sixteen, and then. Um, and it wasn't done well in the, the parish that I went to. Sunday mass was like 19 minutes, all right? And my father was not a pious man. He was a very good man, but that bothered even him. Uh, I was always drawn to it because um, I have a degree in Latin and I just, I love the Latin in, just in itself. But I was, uh, I was afraid that because of that, it would harm my apostolate for um, a humani vitae, that I was already on the far fringe of things. And if I got associated with the Latin mass community, nobody would listen to me. I would, I would just be too far off. And honestly, it wasn't available anywhere uh, for years and years and years, and so obviously. And so I went to the odd one now and then, but they were, again, it, they couldn't be done well. They were sometimes sort of in classrooms and in schools and places. So that the, 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 what we have now is unbelievably different from what I, I grew up with. And somehow God just roped me in in the last year. Uh, there were just times when I, um, I go somewhere and the only mass that was being said, honestly, was the Latin mass. And mm -hmm. I was I was completely overwhelmingly roped in i mean not kicking and streaming but after about three or four times i didn't want to go anywhere else and i still don't i'm i'm done i'm done with the nova sorry everybody but i don't mean to trash the nova's order but i'm done yeah. all right I, I spent a lifetime of of crazy liturgies and now having this most incredible reverent um transcendental uh liturgy i Honestly, I can't wait to get there, and I don't want to leave, and I want to get as often as I can. Uh, I, st I go to the Novus Ordo sometimes because that's all I have for daily mass around here, but um, I sit in the back, and I try to pretend I'm not <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Novus Ordo, sorry. I, I, you know. So anyway, it's, been, it, it's done amazing things for my um, spiritual life, and even my just... Um, a psyche. Mm -hmm. I'm so much calmer, and my. And I mean, it's it's probably irreverent to say something like this, but I get into kind of a Zen zone. I mean, I, you know, I kneel down, and everything of the world goes away, and I know that soon I'm going to be immersed in something, where I mean, honestly, this has been over two years now, and I. I, I don't know exactly why. Today is the first day that my mind wandered during the Latin Mass, where mm. I thought about where I was going to get lunch. All right, I have not done. I have not. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sorry that that happens. It happened all the time when I was in the Novus Order. It was, today was the first time, and it was it was it was like jarring to me. It's mm. like, what what am I doing? Why is my my mind uh, going somewhere else? So 
anyway, I it's been marvelous for me. And the one thing that has really been a surprise is that over the last two years, I'd call up a friend I hadn't talked to for a couple months and I'd say, you know, I'm going back to the lab mess. Oh, and friend say, oh, yeah, I am too. Yeah, our family has too. And these were some of these were very unlikely people. Um, I never would have thought they would have uh, found the Latin mass. And it just keeps happening. I just keep running into people that say, I, I just found the Latin mass. Where's it been? Why haven't I known? And of course, I'm, I'm now you know, one of the older people there, which is no surprise. But I am stunned at the young families. And yeah. it, it's it, and the one I'm going to now, it might, it, it, you know, it's a gift beyond compare that my very own parish is offering the Latin mass. I never, I mean, I, honestly, I was, I mean, I've lived through the really bad liturgies. I was at Notre Dame in the eighties and they had women up at the altar, basically con celebrating. Of course, had everybody come around the altar. They wouldn't even say the words of consecration uh, in a prop, in, in, in the right way. I mean, it was just, it was agonizing to go to mass, uh, torture. And it, it, in some of the masses I go to in my hometown, where I helped my mother for several years, I, you know, I just think, wow, if that's all I ever had, I don't know if I could retain my faith. Hmm. But they still do hootenanny music. They still do. You still go into the mass on Christmas Eve, and it's just anyway. Just and just for those who are who are might be worried, the intent of this uh, conversation, is, <laughs> the, the intent of the conversation isn't isn't to uh, isn't to uh, isn't to you know, necessarily uh, criticize the ordinary form. I it it is beautiful to hear your experience, though, Janet, and uh, it's it's certainly true of many others. I want to switch over to uh, uh, to Peter and talk a little bit about the uh, his his new book, uh, the Holy Bread of Eternal Life. Peter, one of the things I appreciated about it is that whether the person whether someone attends, let's say a um, you know, a, 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 a good ordinary form mass or the Latin mass, they can, I think they can gain a great deal of understanding how to participate in a much deeper way because of what you've written here. Did you intend to reach both, uh, you know, where Janet is now and then, you know, folks uh, who are in a Novus Ordo ordinary form mass? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as, as you know, I've written a number of books that are more specifically about the the TLM, the traditional Latin mass extraordinary form. Um, I didn't want this book to be another one of those books. This book is, is my witness, my heartfelt, passionate witness to the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. It's all about that. And of course, there are liturgical implications to what I say, and I draw out some of those. But the main thing I want to share with people in this book is, you know, something that's been growing in, in me for decades as I've, you know, in my own journey of faith, which has become more and more focused and centered on the Holy Eucharist um, through adoration and through attending liturgy, both Eastern and Western liturgies and so on, is, is just this, this sense of, of how, what a gift, what an ineffable treasure God has given us in the Holy Eucharist. It's ab it's beyond anything we can conceive or imagine, but we need to try. We need to try to break open our minds and hearts to appreciate this gift. I think so many people take it for granted. So many Catholics don't even really believe. I mean, we know that from the statistics. So I, I wanted to reignite and rekindle Eucharistic fervor. That's my main intention with this book. But then, practically speaking, I want to say, okay, well, if this is all true, if what the church teaches is really true, then what are we, what, a, what practical concrete steps can we take to improve our Eucharistic faith, our piety, our reverence? Um, how should we behave towards this gift, right? If, if God is going to give you his very own son, how are you going to receive him? You know, are you going to receive him the way Our Lady received him, the way the saints have received him, right? Um, and so then that's why, and then that's why I get into all these questions, like, uh, you know, um, what are the appropriate signs of reference towards the Blessed Sacrament? You know, why is catechesis not enough? Why do we need good, pious, reverent liturgy, right? So I'm, I'm talking about all these things, but somewhat more generally, it's, it's not meant to focus on this form or that form of the liturgy. Well, in, in doing that, of course, we do, we do have to talk about some things that that cross boundaries that are going to make folks uncomfortable. And, and, and I've, I, I think our audience is very mixed. You know, we have uh, traditional Latin mass 
uh, and uh, ordinary form. We've got a quite a huge number of people signed up, and I want to first say that I, knowing you, just in a brief time, you and I interacted about this book before it came to publication. You, you know, though you are clear, and I, I, I my sense is Janet is this way as well. Though you're very clear uh, in your mind about uh, and and about the tradition, I mean, and and un, unapologetic. Nobody here is judging anyone or criticizing any person, in the sense of, because um, I want to get into a ta- I want to get into a, a, a specific aspect of this, in the sense that the formation, in particular, in the ordinary form side, since the Second Vatican Council has been horrifying, and I don't think, I, I doubt you'd find many bishops who would disagree with that. So this isn't. Mm-hmm. This isn't, um, this isn't, uh, I'm not stating something that's outrageous. The formation's been horrible. And so you have well-intended people, good people, who do a lot of things that they think is normal and appropriate, but that really is contrary to, to, to tradition. So with that statement, and I'm saying, you know, the, the, we're not judging or condemning anyone's statement, I want to move into, I think, a practice that you cover well that's been really surprising to me, and that is communion, how we receive communion. Uh, To set this up, one of the things that was shocking to me was I used to think uh, traditional TLM folks were a little fringy when they talked about, you know, well, you know, this was brought about by a disobedience and, you know, the the bishops of the world didn't want this and all of that. And then I read Memoriale Domine, (laughs) right? Which is the document that Pope Paul VI um, uh, sent out through the CDF essentially that said, we're going to allow this. I was shocked. It, what shocked me is one, he argued for a very reverent approach to de- receiving the Eucharist, which doesn't exist in most nor- ordinary form uh, masses. I mean, what he argued for doesn't, even what he allowed doesn't exist um, in the sense that it, it, he argued that it should be done reverently, that communion on the tongue should be retained. Uh, he argued that it was more of a humble position or the, the CDF document that he approved argued all of that. So talk a little bit about that situation, how we ended up where we are, where uh, we're so far, even from Memoriale Domini, in my opinion. It, it's, you know, it's a big question. This is a huge question because it, it involves, it connects about a dozen different topics, but I'm going to try to be very, I'll try to be very succinct here. It seems to me what happened is this. If you take the very long view and you look at the whole of church history and the history of the liturgy, what you can see is an ever intensifying awareness of the real presence of Christ and the magnitude of that and the 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 profound meaning of that and the and the fact that we should approach the the Holy Eucharist, you know, obviously with joy and with longing but also always with adoration and with humility and with repentance, right? So we need, and with fear, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So, I mean, we, we don't approach God, you know, just sauntering up and like equals to equals. This is totally absurd. We don't do that with our Lord. So the, the trajectory of, of the development of the liturgy was always towards enhancing and amplifying the reverence. And that's why people in the West, in the Western tradition, the Latin church, um, we moved from receiving standing to receiving kneeling. You know, we moved from reception in the hand uh, in the early church to reception on the tongue for everybody except for the priest. Um, and so these developments happened. And as Pius XII said, it's a mistake to think that it's always better to, to leapfrog over centuries of development and go back to the way that apparently early Christians did it. I mean, we sometimes don't even know exactly what they did because the records are not very good. Uh, but Pius XII said it's a mistake to think that the developments were wrong. They too were guided by the Holy Spirit. So when you get to Memoriale Domini of, uh, of the, I guess it's from the Congregation for Divine Worship, but Paul it was, that's right. yeah. approved it. Um, what he says there is that the traditional practice, receiving on the tongue, kneeling, is most fitting, that it, as you said, it expresses humility, it expresses worship, it shows, uh, and this is very important, that the food is not ordinary food. Right. But it's divine, immortal food, right? It's heavenly food, uh, the holy bread of eternal life. It's from, the title of my book comes from the Roman canon. It's a, a phrase from the Roman canon. And so he says this should be retained. 
And in fact, the bishops who were consulted, the vast majority of bishops also said it should be retained. But then there's a second part of the document, and it's odd because there's kind of there's no real transition. It looks like something that was tacked on, right. um, on another hand, quite possibly, uh, although it was pr- approved. And it says, but if communion in the hand has arisen in some places, it may be permitted under the regulations of the of the Episcopal Conference. So. I I think what you have here is a classic case of 1960s confusion, where certain people had reintroduced a a supposedly ancient practice, but I think for modernistic reasons, um, I'll get to that in a moment, and they they had reintroduced it, and Paul VI was trying to do damage control by reaffirming the traditional practice, but also allowing certain exceptions. And, And that's where the disobedience began, because a lot of Episcopal conferences, which didn't which where, where there was no communion in the hand suddenly jumped onto the bandwagon and asked for permission to do it, even though that wasn't the intention of, of Memoriale Domini. Um, the comment I made about modernists is, is just this, that when you read a church father like Cyril of Jerusalem or John Chrysostom talking about communion in the hand, the way they speak about it is totally different from the way the 1960s theologians were speaking about it. For them, they wanted mass to be reconfigured as a meal, as a fraternal meal, very horizontal, very um, kind of chummy in a sense, uh, like we're just breaking bread together, you know. And that was a mistake because that 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 was not shot through with the same kind of piety and sense of mystery and majesty that you find in the church fathers. So that's that's the kind of that's the false antiquarianism that Pius the Twelfth was was warning about. Right? Does that make sense? It does. I think he did. He did. He did. He use the phrase the heresy of antiquarianism, or did that come elsewhere? No, no, he didn't use that. I think somebody else. There was another author who, who brought that up, but Pius the Twelfth just simply said false antiquarianism. Yeah, and no, everything you're saying it makes sense, and I think I want to get down to very specifics because a because a lot of folks who argue for communion of hand, in the hand, of course, speak of Cyril of Jerusalem or, or you know, uh, uh, the, the short list of, of saints that spoke about it uh, then, they did not do it the way that uh, it's done in a, tr- in a typical ordinary form parish. Can you describe a little bit about those distinctions? So, and I get, the reason I want to do this, I just want to set this up, is to say, if you're going to make that argument that yeah. we should do it uh, we should receive it in the hand because this such and such a saint said it in this way or that way. We we should probably understand how exactly they did do it, which is, but it, it's very much a contrast to modern right. practice. Yes, well, I mean, very br- briefly, you know, some patristic scholars, Michael Fiedrowitz, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, Nicola Bux, um, they all talk about the fact that if you look carefully at the records, and as you say, there there's not a lot of information, but there's there's certainly some information. Um, it seems that 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 uh, communion, when it was received in the hand, was always received in the right hand, never in the left hand. Um, and that for that for symbolic reasons, right? The right hand is sort of the hand of dignity and the hand of strength. The left side is, symbolically speaking, in a sense, the side of the devil. Um, that's throughout scripture. But uh, you received in the right hand and you didn't feed yourself, right? As, as in picking up the, the morsel and putting it into your own mouth, but you bowed down in a, in, a, in a sign of adoration, and you licked up the, the, the holy bread with your mouth. So you basically used your hand like a paten, okay? It, we all know what a paten is. It's that metal plate yeah. that's put under the host, right? So your hand was like a fixed stationary paten, and you lowered yourself in a sign of humility and adoration, and you, you licked up the, the bread from your hand. Now, people might say, oh, that sounds weird. Well, no, it's not. If it, even today in the Byzantine liturgy, uh, which is has less developed rubrics than the Roman rite had and has. Um, the, the, the priest, you know, he uses leavened bread, so it's a little more crumbly. And he goes around, you know, licking and, and, and you know, dotting up with his finger all the little bits of bread, and then he licks his hands too. I've seen this. I've seen this at Byzantine liturgies, okay? Sorry. So they're, they're, more, they, they're more archaic in a sense than we are, right? So the, the, what the priest does at the Byzantine liturgy is kind of the same idea of licking from your hand. Um, so what we're not looking at here is this idea of I walk right up with full stature standing, you know, face to face with the priest and I put out my hands and I receive this food and then I feed myself with it. 
Um, that that's that's never been done in the history of the church. That's not even that's just novelty, right? To do it that way. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me what I what I really want to say about this is it's it's even if the early Christians did certain things uh, with goodwill. Um, there's a reason why the church developed, even by the end of the first millennium, away from that, right? right? It's not as if universally the entire church in East and West, and we are literally talking about every single Christian on the face of the planet, by the end of the first millennium was receiving communion in the mouth from the priest, right? Either with a spoon, as in the East, or directly from the priest's hand, you know, onto the tongue in the West. I mean, that, that's just a, a universal thing. That happens not for incidental, you know, light reasons. Um, and it seems to me there, well, I don't know if you want me to get a little bit into the reasons why that developed. I think it's important for people to understand why it developed. Sure, yeah. And then I want to talk to Dr. Smith about yes. a little bit more about her experience coming in. I We got cut off earlier. I apologize if I cut you off, but keep going, Peter. And then I want to come back to Janet and her oh, sure. transition. Sure. So it, it seems to me that when now again I'm going to talk about the Latin, uh, the Western Church. So the Byzantine Church is is similar but not quite the same. So I want to leave that for a sep that's a separate issue. But in the Western Church, Latin Rite Church has developed that the faithful that only the priest handled the Blessed Sacrament. Why? Because he stands in persona Christi Capitis. He's in the person of Christ, the head of the church. He is standing in for Christ, the high priest. Um, and Christ speaks through him. Christ transubstantiates uh, the host and the chalice through him to make them the body and blood of Christ. And, there, and, and his hands in the rite of ordination are anointed with the sacred chrism. As if to say, these hands are being blessed and consecrated in a special way to handle this awesome, divine, immortal, life-giving food. Okay, And so the priest is the one to whom it's fitting to distribute uh, the bread of life. And the faithful, for their part, we have the dignity of being baptized into the common priesthood of Christ. Our dignity is to receive this divine gift. I don't need to handle it. I don't need to distribute it in order to have dignity. My dignity is to receive our Lord. What greater dignity could there be than that, actually? I mean, it's even greater for the priest to receive Jesus than for him to confect the Eucharist, right? I mean, it, at, at the end of the day, we have to just say that that's true. Um, so it belongs to the, the priest to consecrate and distribute. It belongs to the faithful to receive. And what better way to receive than with a bodily gesture of humility, reverence, and adoration, which is to fall on our knees the way the Magi did. This is a very scriptural thing, right? This is not something that was invented by medieval people, superstitious people. It's in scripture. We fall on our knees when we're in the presence of God. And when we're on our knees and we tilt our head back, the priest in persona Christi, he feeds us, right? We're fed by, by God. God the Father feeds us with the bread that is his son. Um, and that shows the proper relationship of creator and creature, of savior and redeemed. That is the proper relationship. We are not the ones who save ourselves. We're not equals to God. You know, we don't assert our independence and autonomy. We, we should be lowly and adoring and full of, 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 uh, of, of humble reference. And that the kneeling posture and receiving on the tongue really strongly emphasizes all of those truths, which are so important. I would say these are fundamental truths of the Christian faith. I agree with you, Janet. In 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 watching you from afar and, and listening to your transition, was when you were in the ordinary form, had you come to conclusions regarding how to engage with the Eucharist before you switched to the Latin Mass? Not no, not a bit. Okay. Um, my switching was kind of a, it was such a surprise. It was um, just being going to various liturgies because again, I went to um, Phoenix, uh, was staying at a hotel, and the nearest uh, church was one that was Nova Sorda. I mean, um, TLM. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to uh, Baltimore, and friends said I needed to go to St. Alphonsus Liguri Church while I was there. I didn't even know it was TLM. I got there, it was whoa. So <laughs> over and over again. In the, in the space of a year, I went to Dallas to visit some friends, and I decided they, and I kind of made fun of them over the years. I hate to say it. You know, they would only go to the 
Peter, you're laughing at me. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I, you know, I asked him one time, did I ever really mock you or anything for, for giving you a hard time? And the only thing, at one time, they would not recognize the legitimacy of the Novus Ordo. And my friend was very grateful that I moved her around to see that she should do that. But, um, I mean, I ended up going to Mass all morning. I got there early, midway through the first Mass, and then I, I just stayed and prayed, and then I stayed for the second Mass. And again, I felt I could stay all day. It was mm. just something that just captivated me. But... I mean, I, there was a conscious moment when I was at Notre Dame that I decided I was going to learn nothing about the liturgy because it would just disturb me. Mm. And I, it, everything I know, when I see that they, they're breaking some rubric, they're doing something, I just get upset. So I said, I am just going to remain in blessed ignorance about what, but sometimes you couldn't help it. I mean, at one time, one of my friends was at the Basilica and at the end of Mass, she stood up and shouted to the whole church, I, I, Father, you need to tell people they didn't receive a valid Eucharist today. You never said the words of consecration that the church prescribes. And he said, well, just come up and talk to me afterwards. And he told her, uh, maybe you need to attend a different liturgy because people are accustomed to that here and it doesn't bother them. Hmm. Wow. Wow. That's quite remarkable. I, You know, for me, I came in uh, as an Anglican seminarian and, and our liturgy was quite beautiful. Uh, obviously yeah. it wasn't valid but uh, i was telling uh, peter before the we did the opened on the webinar that it was a a real beautiful blend um uh, but most much more like the traditional latin mass than the ordinary form today but but had some uh, more in the vernacular and so when i came in i was i was a bit shocked at what i saw in the in the liturgy the first liturgy i I attended actually before I converted was at a church in the round and it was for Christmas. And I thought, well, if, if there's going to be good liturgy, it's going to be during Christmas. So I'll go there. The parish didn't even have kneelers. And I was so scandalized, not even Catholic yet, but I was so scandalized that I said, and oh, and then the pews were made such that it wasn't possible to kneel. So they purposely made it. You couldn't kneel on the floor if you were going to kneel. So I knelt in the aisle as a non-Catholic scandalized yeah. by what was going on in this liturgy. Uh, it's, I, I, think, I think I think everybody of a certain age has all these sort of battle scars and, you know, and stories uh, from the trenches that they could share. Uh, the parish I grew up in in New Jersey was the same way, padded chairs with no kneelers, um, carpet everywhere, purple carpet, you know, in the round. I mean, just a crazy place. When I look back, I didn't know any of that. When I was growing up, I had no idea how irregular and how weird it was. But later, as I learned more about the faith, I just, I just thought this is crazy. What the, who, you know, whoever the people who designed this did not have the faith of the church. That's right. really, is, it comes down to that. Um, and you know, this, this question has just come up of beauty, right? It's come up in a way sort of marginally, but you know, Janet's mentioned it. Some of the beautiful churches like St. Alphonsus, you've mentioned it with the, with the Anglican liturgy. And I, I just want to make this point about beauty, which does come up in my book a little bit, um, but not as much as it does in some of my other, other books. Um, it seems to me that if we believe that our Lord is really, truly, substantially present in the Holy Eucharist, that's the that's the the burning, pulsing heart of the Mass is is His Eucharistic presence. Then everything with which the Church has surrounded the Mass over all the centuries, beginning with the beautiful building and the architecture of it, the stained glass, the statues, the communion rail, all of these parts of the Church. And then the music with which the liturgy is is uh, imbued, um, and the vestments, right, and the incense, and everything, all these things we do, it's not just for aesthetic reasons. It's not because we're we're the kind of esthetes who like to go to museums and feel sophisticated. It has, it's not about that. <laughs> it's it's about bestowing on our Lord the greatest and best and most beautiful things we can give him and the things that will lift up our spirits and will actually make us realize that we're in the house of God, we're in his temple, we're in his presence. You know, this is not, uh, you know, the, this is not uh, your office or your school or your bedroom or your living room or whatever. This is the temple of God, right? And, and that is, um, and so the beautiful, the role of the beautiful in Eucharistic reverence is also really crucial and, and very much underestimated. I agree. I had an experience. I am hearing feedback. I think it's, can you, I'm echoing. So Janet, um, 
I'm sure you've been to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. I imagine uh, Peter may have as well. Uh, which which one in Mother our... Angelica? Yes. Yeah. The, and I wonder yeah. what the if the if. Oh, sorry, we're having a little bit of audio audio issue. Okay, it's solved. Um, I wonder what both of your 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 uh, your reactions would be when I first entered into the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, and this is to speak to Peter's point, um, which has the second tallest monstrance in the world. And of course it's gold everywhere. And it's, you know, God bless Mother Angelica for the, for, for, and the donors for this amazing place. I was immediately went to my knees. And that was my instinct was to go to my knees. How did it affect you guys walking in that beautiful place? And, and how does that relate to what we're talking about here? Well, um, I had an interesting experience. I was traveling to uh, Florida with my sister and her four very young children. Um, and, and one of whom, uh, to this day, now he's 30, I mean, has never shown the slightest um, understanding of the supernatural or the transcendent or any inclination towards religion. And my sister was quite angry that I had um, really insisted that we were going to to go off the ro road, take this side trip to see this this shrine, and it was you know you know just, you can't make kids do this kind of stuff. And I said, well, they're they're just going to have to. I I have to see this. We're in the neighborhood. We're going to do it. And um, I know you all all people think I'm just really this pushy bossy person, but really I'm I well doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> I can't. I can't argue against that point for this story. Anyway, so we got there and we walk in and my nephew, my nephew, he's probably um, maybe 10 or 11 at that point. Again, not, never shows the slightest reverence, anything. He just says, Aunt Janet, I think that if there's a heaven, it can't be any more beautiful than this. <sighs> and it was just, you could just say he was blown away. You know, and you just see that it touches the heart of a little boy like that, who's kind of, for various family reasons, unfortunate things, he'd been hardened to, his father was a, a very anti-religious, and so he sort of inherited that attitude from his dad. And so just seeing that was just ex extraordinary uh, to me, to see the effect that it could have on, on a young man. And I, I often feel when I, I'm in front of uh, a tabernacle, it's just like, wow. Uh, Jesus came. He came to us and he wants to be, he's in Ypsilanti, Michigan, you know, and you just think, and he's in a beautiful tabernacle here and, and all these people who have uh, sacrifices over the years um, to, to do this. And it just, it's a stunning thing that you can get it down the street. Yes. And, you know, uh, it's just incredible. I, I'm sure you both know um, if you if you looked at Augustine, Father Augustine Thompson's big biography of Saint Francis of Assisi, which is really important biography. Um, mm. He's able to show from all the source documents that Saint Francis, the the number one concern of Saint Francis, his priority was Eucharistic reverence and mm. the beauty and cleanliness. Mm of the churches, the appropriateness of the vessels and the vestments. I mean, this is the, il, you know, il poverello, you know, the, the poor man, the hippie that, that as the people like, <laughs> no, 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 he wasn't, I mean, yeah, he was radically poor, but he always wanted the best and the most beautiful things for our Lord. That, that just makes sense. If you're in love with someone, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't want them to live in a dirt hovel or some kind of little plastic box or something. I mean, you, you want them to have the best that you can provide for them. I, I think we need help, right? You talked about going into the church. That I've never been to that shrine, unfortunately, but I've been to other ones, you know, of similar um, impressiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think we need help, right? We're fallen human beings. Our tendency, we're born into this world. Basically, I like to say we're born as materialists, right? All that The only thing that we can appreciate is what's in front of our senses, you know, we're not very spiritual. We, we, it's with difficulty that we pray and that we elevate our minds to God. Um, and so, you know, St. Thomas, when he's talking about why we have sacraments, he says God wanted to meet us where we were and bring us to where we were not. He wanted right. to lift us up through sensible beauty through and through sensible things like water, oil, bread, wine um, to himself. 
And so it's this pedagogy, this wonderful divine, you know, leading by the hand. And that's why the church, Catholic churches were always beautiful. From the very time of the Emperor Constantine onwards, every church that was built had to be the best and most beautiful it could be. Uh, and I think this just shows a kind of realism about the capacity of human beings and their needs. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, architecture uh, it tells you what's, I mean, art, architecture speaks, right? It's, it, it, it has a doctrinal component to it. It either tells you the truth or it doesn't. It tells mm -hmm. you what's most important in a room. If, if it has a directionality and there's a, 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 point, a focal point or not, mm -hmm. uh, it tells you how big or small you are. It yes. tells you, you know, and, and I really think um, that, of course, you know, since the council um, and, the, and the, the craziness of the 70s, just culturally, we've, we've wrecked so many places of worship or built them without this sense of understanding that the, the, our physical surroundings can dispose us to encounter God or keep us or hinder us from encountering God. Yes. Yeah. I, in fact, you know, you, you mentioned the, the bad architecture of the seventies, which of course began in the fifties. I mean, sure. I, there's a church not far from where I live. That's just hideous. That's from the fifties. Um, but I, I, what's interesting when you read all these people, I have a whole library full of liturgical books from all different decades from the, you know, from all different centuries, in fact, but but I, I especially am interested in reading what people were saying in the 30s, 40s, 50s. What were they thinking, right? Some of them were on the right track, but some of them were way off. They were on the space age, you know, we're moving into a new humanity, a new future, you know, a new kind of man that's not like anyone that's ever existed before. And one thing, one common thread I've seen with the more modernist authors from that time before the council and after the council is they have this kind of, you used the word Zen earlier, but they, they have this weird sort of um, like the more stripped down a church is, the more empty it is. If it's whitewashed, it has no images, no, be no beauty to, for the eye, it, then it's somehow more pure and, and somehow more authentic and more sincere. And it, fo it focuses us more on what's essential, right? I mean, I'm sure you've all run across this, this line of, of reasoning. It's completely absurd. It, it has nothing to do with how human beings work and have yeah. ever, will ever work. Did you ever visit the um, chapel at the John Paul II Center in Washington, D.C., the original one? It was it was like a cinder block jail cell. Mm -hmm. There were just little, little windows up there and, and nothing yes. uh, of, of beauty. And then a couple of years ago, they renovated it and put in a beautiful, beautiful chapel. Right. And it but but when you when I first went, yeah, it just you just think this is just a violation of everything, you know. That yeah. it's so as you said, bare and stripped down. And of course, I lived through the time, and I, I, it's a real question. I mean, are there still places where the tabernacles off to the? I mean, I know one, um, but I, mean, I didn't think I'd live long enough to see the tabernacle return to the center of the church. I yeah. again, I have a vivid memory when I at was teaching at Notre Dame. And of course they can't move the one in the main basilica, thank God. But they did in the um, in the crypt. And the crypt is just a chapel, right? And it's a crypt chapel. And it's, it's a very long, narrow chapel. And then they have like two side storage areas. And they put the chapel in the place where they stored the, the, the chairs when they needed excess chairs. I, I went into some sort of fit, you know, that I, I couldn't believe it, that you moved the chapel, tabernacle out of the center of this chapel and moved it over there. Nobody knows it's there. You can't see it. And you have to you have to move past chairs to get to it. And I was told, yes. of course, that, oh, well, people want to pray in front. It shouldn't compete with the Eucharist that's being performed and people yeah. shouldn't have a place to pray. It was crazy. But this is this is a great example. You know, earlier I was mentioning this idea of false antiquarianism, you know, that just because the early Christians received communion in the hand doesn't mean it's best always and everywhere to receive communion in the hand or that we should recover that after a thousand years and more of a contrary practice. I mean, they also say this about tabernacles, right? It's true that in the early church, the Blessed Sacrament was not reserved in the in the center of the church. That's absolutely true. But the development that took place was very appropriate because what you see when you go into a traditional Catholic church is you see this amazing constellation of the high altar, the tabernacle, 
and the crucifix. And it's all on the same vertical, you know, plane. It's it's right there in a line so that when you come into the church, your mind is sort of overwhelmed with the sense of the grandeur of God, the presence of our Lord, and the altar of sacrifice. It all comes together. All of those things are are sort of orbiting around the same axis, if I can put it that way. And it it's we can see why that happened that way. Because then during the liturgy, it's not a question of am I bowing towards the cru- the crucifix or towards the tabernacle? Where am I supposed to genuflect? What's going on? No, it's all just one place. Totally clear. <laughs> and it's it that clarity, in fact, is what catechizes us most deeply, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I mean, you hear people say, "Oh, you know, we could solve the Eucharistic crisis in the church if we just catechized people better." No, that's baloney. Cate- textbook catechesis is not the solution to our problems. It's a component. It's necessary. I think we need to bring back the Baltimore Catechism. Forget about all this modern day schmoozy catechism stuff. Bring back the Baltimore Catechism and have children memorize the answers. But that's still not enough. They need to see in the church and in the liturgy the 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 visible, audible expression of what Catholics believe. It's the lex orandi, lex credendi thing, right? How we pray should show what we believe. We, we, we don't need to study a book to get that. Let me uh, make sure folks who are watching are reminded, and I don't know if we can put it up on the screen or if it's already there for our producer, but the Holy Bread of Eternal Life, Restoring Eucharistic Reverence in an Age of Piety, it's up there, um, it's up on the screen. Uh, we're, we're talking about a lot of what uh, Peter talks about in his book and, and does such an amazing job. I wanna transition uh, to another aspect of encountering the Lord in the Eucharist, which has a dimension in the realm of moral theology and in liturgy, it crosses all both of your expertise quite well. And, and it was, it was, a, it, 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 my discovery of, uh, was a shock of this missing passage to give you a hint, uh, of where we're going because, uh, I came to the Catholic church, many reasons, right? The Catholic mystical tradition drew me in. It, probably the mo- the biggest way, and then the, the apostolic fathers, and um, but reading the New Testament, you know passages like "If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you." But the one passage that really struck me, you know, for years before I became Catholic was was First Corinthians eleven twenty seven, and this idea that there, and it really was mind bending for me as a Protestant because I'm thinking, well, how is this? If this is just a symbol. How, how is this happening? So, so the passage basically says, I don't have it in front of me, but it says that if you eat the eat, eat if you participate in a way, and maybe one of you can pull it up and, and get the exact passage. You have it there? You want to read it, Peter? Sure. Yeah, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 29. Um, Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink of the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself or examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the chalice. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, or some translations have condemnation. Or damnation in the Nox translation. Not discerning the body of the Lord. So that's the passage. So what, what rocked my world a bit as a Protestant was, how is it if this is just a symbol that people are dying <laughs> or, or getting sick? I mean, I, it doesn't make any sense, you know, in, in terms of Protestant theology in any, any, any framework, even uh, high Anglican or Anglo-Catholic, I, in my opinion, not to be disrespectful to the, to the Anglicans, but I, I just, I didn't see it. So I'm asking the question, how is this possible? And where did this teach, where did we lose this teaching? And obviously I found out back in the Catholic church, but the thing that shocked me was that um, there, that's been removed from the, uh, from the lecture, from the uh, readings of the, in the ordinary form mass. Yes. Yes. It, it's actually, it's really scandalous. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it um, because, you know, as, 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 as probably, I mean, as certainly you know, and many of the, my listeners will know as well, that um, the lectionary of the old mass is much smaller than the lectionary, the new or reformed lectionary, uh, which was 
touted as, as a great uh, advancement or a step forward in biblical literacy. Um, but the problem is that there are quite a number of important passages that had always been read by the church, including 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, that were omitted purposefully when the new lectionary was, was put together. Why do I say omitted purposefully? That seems like a pretty you know, bold claim to make. Well, the fact is that all the other verses around that part are there, but not those, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they were left out. And you see this pattern frequently that, that verses are kind of snipped out here and there because they say something that was deemed difficult or objectionable or, or too harsh or liable to misunderstanding or whatever, which to me is just supremely arrogant on the part of the, the people who put the lectionary together. We need to hear the whole unadulterated word of God. You know, I sound like those, you know, like those Protestant chapels, they say like the unadulterated word of God, right? right? right. But that's what we need. That's what Catholics had. And that's what we still need. Mm -hmm. And this passage in particular, I mean, when you think about so many examples, like, like um, you think about, you know, Catholic, so-called Catholic politicians who shouldn't be receiving communion because of what they support and so on. I mean, this, this warning of Paul is absolutely relevant and timely. It always is, and it's it's urgent to hear it and to take it to heart. Yeah, it seems to me there are two, there are two aspects of this, and, and Janet, maybe you can comment. Mm. One is the, the, the sin of the person who approaches, who's not, who's in a state of mortal sin, right? So you're in a state of mortal sin, you, you're approaching and you're receiving the Eucharist, which is mortal sin on top of mortal sin. And not only is it a mortal sin, and please correct me, you guys are the experts. To me, it's desecration uh, at that point, it, or it has an equivalent moral weight to it because, because you're, you're, you're essentially receiving um, the Lord. You're, you're, you're not in union, you're not in communion. It's not, it's, it's, it's a kind of a lie. It's, uh, it's, uh, you're receiving the, 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 the true body, blood, soul, and divinity into a state that's deeply uh, corrupted, if you will, and separated from the life of God. So that's one aspect. And then the other is the sin of the person who might give it to me, who knows I'm in unrepentant mortal sin. And that, that is uh, clearly the case with uh, politicians who unequivocally are pro-abortion mm -hmm. or, or pro-contraception and do all that they can to advance those things. You know, for either of you, am I overstating how grave it is uh, in this situation? I don't know if Janet, you want to take a shot at that first? I mean, I think that there's, there's, um, whew, uh, it's not just lack of reverence for the Eucharist that is a problem here, or it's that really this notion of universalism that we're all saved. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the, I mean, you're, you have an abortion and it's not doesn't threaten your immortal soul. Nothing does. Everybody's saved. And so everything gets watered, completely watered down is for the importance of going to confession or, or being aware of your sinfulness. Uh, it just is why, if you're all saved, why worry mm -hmm. about it? So, it? so the mass does become a, a communal gathering where you get together and kind of just enjoy um, your friends and you just enjoy, enjoy being together. It's not that this is absolutely essential to your salvation and it's absolutely essential that you repent of your sins and that you believe in the gospel and you transform your lives. That's not something that you hear ever in, you know, maybe now and then. I mean, again, since I've been going to Latin Mass, I've heard more homilies on the need to transform your life and to put Jesus in the absolute center of your life. And as um, Peter mentions in his book, the fact that it, it stuns people that there's confession available uh, at the beginning of Mass and during the Mass. And it's just that sense and how many people you can honestly see this relief, like, oh, yes, I need to go to confession before I go to confession. And it's right here, you know. Yeah. And so that that notion that uh, a purity of self, I mean, as I'm not saying anything that people don't know, but how many parishes have one hour a week of yeah. confession and there's no encouragement to go. So I think it's, it's much more than that. The reason that passage is not included is because of a, 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 a really a heresy that um, we're all saved. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing I agree, Janet, it, it seems to me that, again, it, it always surprises me that the strongest voices 
uh, about communion, unworthy communion, are not recent voices, but the church fathers. I, I quote I quote a passage from St. John Chrysostom that's, you know, would be considered over the top by anybody nowadays, but he's quite serious about the problem of, of approaching in a state of sin. But I quote St. Thomas Aquinas, I quote St. John Vianney, you know, you, you could quote people, St. Thomas Aquinas, I mean, till you could quote people, you know, day in and day out, who all say the same thing. The Catholic faith is absolutely consistent on this point. And it's really only, it seems to me, it's only in the 20th century. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in the field of the history of, you know, communion practices or something. So maybe somebody can find another age where there was a similar problem. But my reading has indicated that it's only in the 20th century that we have lost the sense of the fear of God, the fear of offending God. Um, I think Pius XII famously quipped that the the worst sin of modern man uh, is the loss of the sense of sin, something something to that effect, right? Um, so it seems to me that there's a unique problem that we're facing now of people not actually, maybe not even knowing what the concept of sin means. And what does it mean to be separated from God? Well, even the idea that, that God is a lawgiver and that we're obliged to follow his laws, his commandments, his precepts, um, under pain of death, eternal death, right? I mean, even something as simple as that, which is like kindergarten level Catholicism, I'm not really sure that that's a common notion anymore. Um, so we have a lot of rebuilding that, that has to take place. But once again, the rebuilding is is happening in the way that you say, Janet, that when people see everyone taking the mass seriously and they're on their knees and they're going to confession, it kind of wakes you up like, oh, this is a big deal. There's something serious going on here, right? I mean, you know what I mean? Like you have to first intuit it. You have to first feel that there's that this is a big deal, that going to communion is a big deal. And also to see that some people are not going for whatever reason, you know, maybe they're not feeling well or they're in an irregular marriage or they haven't fasted or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're a mortal sinner. You know, in, in a, in traditional communities, there are people who don't go to communion and nobody judges them for that. But in a lot of parishes, every single person gets up and goes to communion. It's like the ushers tell you, okay, now it's this rose turn. Everybody comes out and everybody goes up. You know, John Paul II and, and Benedict the Sixteenth were complaining about this. But it seems to me that they weren't able to stop it. You know? Yeah, you know, it it one thing is disturbing about this conversation is that it has an end. Uh, it feels like it needs we need three hours uh, to really get scratch the surface. You know, this is a fantastic book uh, that you've written, Peter, the Holy Bread of Eternal Life, published by Sophia Institute Press. I want to circle back to the beginning, um, producer man. Do we have questions, or are we able to do that? They're on my phone. Okay. Um, how, how much time do you both have? I don't want to presume. And uh, I, lot, I thought we were going to 530 anyway. But, okay. Um, All right. I've so got you, time. We can do it. Yeah, got, got a little time. more time. Okay. Um, let me just uh, get, pull up some of these questions. I want to circle back to the beginning. And as I'm getting these questions ready, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch to you, uh, Peter, to talk about this. Okay. I've got. I've got it. Um, so the, w the way we started was I mentioned, you know, I had COVID and, and that this kind of awakening and, and I, I still feel pretty uh, firmly about this idea that it's the, it's, it's, it's the greatest sin of our time, mainly because what I realized was it, it's not a sin. It, it, I, I'm not saying that it's the, the sin of the bishops or the priests, I, I, I'm, but certainly we've had a lot of issues with lit, liturgical abuse. But what I saw in my own mind, in my own eye, in my own experience, I've, I've traveled to every single state in the United States speaking. Even shortly after I was out of quarantine, I was speaking again. I was refused communion. Um, I saw communion distributed with uh, plastic gloves. You know, I got a phone call from one of our community members who had communion. Uh, they were taking them in a little box. Uh, the, the the Lord was placed in little baggies into a Bible study. So the person left the church in a box with little baggies. You know, it, so if it if it wasn't the, the, the most prominent sin of our time before COVID, certainly after we've seen 
rampant uh, liturgical abuse and sacrilege, and I think uh, desecration. So we've gathered together today, and I think in some sense with broken hearts. I mean, Mm -hmm. I am hopeful about the, the future of the faithful in the church and the authentic expression of the church. I am truly hopeful. But we live in very dark times in this, in the respects that we're speaking of. And so part of this gathering, part of the reason the three of us, you know, took time out of our Sunday, which I don't think most of us do this kind of thing on Sunday, is one to say, this is a great book. You all need to read it. Uh, and I really believe that. Uh, whether you're in ordinary form, even if you're, you think we're crazy, I don't know. Uh, and if you're in the Latin Mass, everybody needs to read The Holy Bread of Eternal Life. But we're also asking folks to join with us in a novena of reparation. And Peter, why don't you share with me a little bit about, you know, what what that's about and and how and why people can participate? Yes. Yeah. Now, th- this idea, um, I mean, I will just want to give credit where credit is due. This idea was from Sophia Institute Press, um, the publisher of the book. And uh, they said, wouldn't it be great if we took advantage of this opportunity, you know, this book coming out, um, to gather people together at the beginning of 2021 and to pray in a serious way in reparation uh, for sins against the Eucharist to show our Lord that we that we love him, you know, that we adore him, that we uh, that we want to receive him in the humblest and best way we can. And that we want to uh, do penance for other people, you know, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so that's the idea of the of the of the novena for Eucharistic reparation and supplication. I would say, you know, begging the Lord to help us, uh, to help His Church, to overcome these evils. These evils can be overcome, but I think, you know, to to quote that that uh, frequently quoted line of our Lord: "Some demons only come out by prayer and fasting." Um, and I think there are a lot of demons at work uh, in the world and in the church, and we can see that. I don't need I don't need to go off on a on a tangent to ex- to say what those what those demons are. Um, so we need prayer and we need fasting. Um, so I was and and so the the novena, you know, there's a little prayer that we're praying from uh, Insinu Jesu, uh, which is a book that's been had a profound effect on me. Um, about uh, Eucharistic adoration. Um, And that's, you know, Sophia has been sending that out. And there are some scripture verses to meditate on. We're fasting from one meal. We're skipping a meal uh, during this novena. Um, And we are trying to fast or abstain from social media, which is huge. I mean, that I can already feel like I feel, I feel like a new man. No, just kidding. (laughs) But but it's, it's really healthy. It's really, really healthy to, uh, to give up that, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and uh, we're praying the rosary and the divine mercy chaplet going to mass uh, if we can. So basically what all of, whatever you can do of those things, do them. Yeah. The uh, and for those of you who may be out funny enough, we're telling people to get off social media. It's like me on EWTN radio saying you shouldn't watch television. And, and Doug Hicks going, what did you just say? But uh, <laughs> the um, Eucharistic Penance dot com for those out on social media. Go to that site. You can still sign up. You can receive a, a recording of our broadcast today, and then you'll get the daily. Uh, you'll get the you'll get the novena. So I do have a few questions. We were able to figure that out while you were answering that question, and either of you can jump in. It's it's up to you guys. Uh, first one: What can I do to receive communion when churches are closed? It's from Anna Ashton. Mm-hmm. Uh, often the priest will, uh, my, my parish priest, I, I actually am teaching him Latin because he wants to do the Latin mass. And um, while I was teaching him Latin, he, you know, we're, during the whole COVID insanity, I uh, would say, you know, Janet, if you asked me, I could give you the Eucharist. And I just kept thinking, well, why should I have special privileges? But, you know, he just kept saying, if you asked me, I could give you the Eucharist. You know, and so I finally said, can I get the Eucharist? And so they set up a tremendous plan, um, you know, that hours on uh, uh, during the day and on the weekend, they would throw three entries of the church. They would, uh, you, you know, you'd come and get the Eucharist. And it was just such a consolation. So certainly you can ask any priest um, to, to give you the Eucharist. Uh, many of them will. 
So I, I don't think you should, if there's, if there's a time when, for, if you're ill and you don't want to um, infect others, and you can tell the priest that so he can take precautions, but if there, there's all sorts of reasons why you might want to receive the Eucharist outside of Mass. Um, mm -hmm. Just ask the priest. Yes, and of course we wouldn't want to make that a norm, a normal thing, right. but for right. exceptional circumstances, and, and we've seen exceptional circumstances, you know, it, it can be appropriate to ask for that. And I, I know people have heard this maybe even too much, um, but I, I think it's still worth repeating because the saints, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Thomas Aquinas, they all talk about it. You know, spiritual communion is a real thing. It's a very powerful practice. If we, if we recollect ourselves and we enter into the presence of our, of, of our God and we tell him, you know, with, with a heart full of faith and love that we wish to receive him, we wish we could receive him sacramentally, but we can't. And we ask him to come to us nonetheless with his grace. Um, that is a very powerful prayer and one that our Lord is very pleased with, because basically we're saying to him, you know, we know you are the source of life. And if we can't receive you in the sacrament, then we want to receive as much grace as you can give us uh, as if we were receiving the sacrament. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's actually an act of faith in the Eucharist and it's an act of adoration towards the Eucharist, even when we're not close to a church. Right. So I think that's another way of building up Eucharistic faith. Yeah, we have, an, we have a community member of Apostoli Via community who's in Amman, for instance. All the mosques are shut down. All the churches are shut down. So there's no no possibility of any uh, direct reception of the sacrament. And in that case, uh, what, you're, what you're describing is really important. And folks, you can go out and do a search for spiritual communion prayers. You can find that out on EWTN. I, I would also just quickly recommend, I think it's, 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 it can be very nourishing to take up a, a missal, an old missal, especially the, the, the Latin mass missal, and read the mass of the day. If you can't make it to mass, just pray, read over those prayers slowly, prayerfully, do a kind of Lexio Divina with the, the prayers of the mass. And that can be very, uh, very nourishing spiritually. Um, so. That's a great, that's a great point. In particular, the, the Latin mass miss, missal and how often you have beautiful commentary uh, in the margins about uh, the Mass, and it's a great way to learn about the Mass uh, and go deeper and prepare for when you can receive again. The one, one caution is in this time, there's a lot of people skipping out on Mass because of a dispensation. If you're healthy and you can go, you should go. If you're healthy and you're not a high-risk person, uh, that you're not why the dispensation is there. Uh, it, you're, the, the dispensations are there for high-risk people and uh, people who, who, who would be threatened uh, gravely uh, if they were to get, get COVID. Um, another question uh, that's a really good one that I, I want to take a shot at first and then send it to you guys. For TLM, do we have to know Latin? Can Novus Ordo be made like TLM? So I'll answer the first question. Can TLM, do we have to know Latin? I would just say this. If you're an ordinary form person, and this is making you curious. The, what you need to do is go and do not try to follow the mass. Um, <laughs> just go and observe and do it for five or six times. Just go be at peace and pray and you'll receive communion. Uh, you'll see if you, there, you go to a normal Latin mass parish, you'll see a long line for folks before mass uh, for, for confession like Janet was talking about. Um, you know, just uh, allow the experience, uh, you allow yourself time to experience it and kind of watch and you'll, after five or six times, you'll get the rhythm. And then, uh, you know, go pick up, there's good books out there, one by Angelus Press, like Introduction to the Latin Mass. Um, you can pick up a missile. Uh, but the, the, the most the problematic thing you can do uh, that'll frustrate you like crazy is try to follow along and act like you do in an ordinary form mass when you go in an extraordinary form. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually completely agree with that. Uh, and part of the reason for the frustration is that, in fact, multiple things are happening at any given time, um, especially at a high mass. And so you can't really follow everything as it's happening. It's not possible. There's too much going on. Uh, so you, you need to, as you said, pick up the rhythm of it. Um, Janet, did you want to comment on any of this? Well, just that I uh, I have several friends who are wanting to go to the Latin Mass, but they find the the Latin an, an obstacle. And uh, you know, I tell them, 
there's very few people, unless you've been going to the Latin Mass for a very long time and know Latin very well, that can, you know, and, and of course the priest speaks sotto voce most of the time. It's more or less quiet, so you can't hear it anyway. And you couldn't follow it anyway. He says it so quickly or his accent is different. And very few people who know Latin very well can understand Latin spoken. They're, they're reading it, right? And so I say, you know, you're not, the, you know, like you're, the, you're not looking around and thinking, everybody knows the Latin. Everybody's following the Latin except me. That is absolutely not true, all right? There may be a handful. I'm one of those. I, I follow it religiously. And I you know, try to listen to Angelus while I'm reading this and the Sanctus while I'm reading it anyway. But what I'm doing for them is trying to show them how to pray the Latin of the Mass when they haven't really studied Latin per se. And I'm doing these lessons that are on my website, and they're in a primitive form now. I'm learning a lot on how to do this, but it's um, GannettSmith.org. And I'm, for instance, we'll go through the Gloria, and I will um, explain all these English derivatives uh, that are that you can know what the Latin words are because you know English, and it, I would say ninety percent of the time you can. And then if you just see how the structure is, and you get the structure of the prayer and the meanings of the words, and I I think if you did it for a week, especially if you did it with uh, some of the singing, if you found a, a YouTube uh, um, beautiful uh, singing of the that before you almost have it memorized, but now you would know what the words mean. Yes. And my friends are really loving it. They're, we're having a great time with it. Mm -hmm. So That's the other point I would just bring up is that, is that the, the actual prayers of the mass are repeated so much from Sunday to Sunday, or from yeah. even from day to day, that it after a while, you it's amazing how much you pick up by osmosis. You know what's going on, you know what's being prayed. You know, and you get used to using a missile to follow along with with some of the quiet parts if you want. Anyway, but the question about can the can the ordinary form be made more like the traditional Latin mass? I mean, of course, the answer is yes, it can. Um, and yes, it should be made to be more traditional, to be more fully Catholic, um, to to draw upon this 2000, actually 3000 year heritage of worship that we have, Judeo-Christian worship. Um, uh, however, it's 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 a challenge. It's a challenge because uh, because you know the faithful have all different sensibilities, and the clergy among themselves don't agree, and the bishops often don't agree with their clergy, and so it's it it can happen, but it's it's fraught with difficulties, and that's I think part of the reason why a lot of people are finding a refuge um, with with the extraordinary form because it just is what it is. It's absolutely totally determinate. It's always the same. The rubrics are always the same. The texts are always the same. It really, I mean, unless somebody doesn't know what he's doing, it's its going to be basically always the same. And for me, that's thats an outstanding plus. That's a real virtue that it has. Yeah, for someone who's, you know, one of our, one of my passions is teaching people mental prayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you know, if you're an ordinary uh, form Catholic, uh, you go to the Nord Novus Ordo and you want to learn to pray and, and sit in silence and and uh, give your heart and mind to God. Um, it, it's a great, it's a great respite. I, I, back to Janet's note, it was kind of funny saying she, she was kept going places and ended up in Latin masses. I was flying back and forth to DC when I was every week when I was the president of EWTN news. And I, my favorite hotel I discovered was the only Latin mass in the area was exactly across the street. I could throw a rock and hit it. So God did the same thing to me. I want to I want to just invite some folks to a, another uh, uh, opportunity to learn how to dig deeper into to tradition. I'll be giving a webinar on um, January 25th on Septuagesima and the pre-Lenten traditions and how you might prepare for Lent. There's a lot of folks out there who will give you blanket prescriptions on what to do for Lent. Usually they're good uh, advice. But often that kind of advice doesn't really get to what you need specifically to grow spiritually. What are the barriers that hinder your your growth? What are the what are the ways you need to grow in virtue? So I'll be walking through that. Find that at spiritualdirection.com and then go to the events page and you'll see that uh, observe Septuagesima Sunday, January twenty fifth. It'll be it'll prepare you for Lent like nothing you've ever experienced through the, the lens of, of faithful tradition of the church. Um, I want to go back to some of the questions for you guys. Uh, here's another one. In the present time with a pandemic raging in the world, we have no Holy Mass. 
uh, we listen online. So this is Ontario, Canada to Sri Lankan Catholic who lives in Ontario. And then we drive to church to receive Holy Communion only. We are administered Holy Communion by a Eucharistic minister, not our priest. We try our best to receive being in a state of grace. We're eager to receive, but is this okay? So I want to take a shot at this uh, just and then give it to you guys. The one thing, you know, I don't, I don't participate in things like that. And I don't participate if I can't receive on my knees and on the tongue. And, and some people might say, well, wait a minute, you're not taking the Eucharist. But you have to understand what the obligation to go to mass um, is not an obligation to receive the Eucharist in a manner that you uh, personally are convicted is, is problematic. And, and I am personally convicted of that. So I only go, I will only receive on my knees. And if I'm refused, then I pray for the one who refused me and I give thanks for the suffering and I go back to the pew. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you end up in a situation like this, you don't have to, you don't have to, I, I mean, I know we want to receive the Lord and I, I, you know, I wept the first time I received the Lord after I came out of COVID. Um, and, and so I get that hunger, but it's important how we participate as well. Yeah. And I want to, I want to add to that. Cause I think this is a question that it comes up over and over again. Um, you know, in the history of the church, there's been a kind of pendulum swing back and forth between frequent or more frequent communion and infrequent, extremely infrequent communion. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that when the great saints talk about this question, I'm thinking of St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas in particular, uh, whom I quote, and I think I quote them in, in the book, um, they, they say there is no rule about how frequently you should receive communion. You should receive communion when you're suitably disposed, you know, when you've prepared yourself adequately for it. Um, really when it's for the good of your soul, as you can, as you can judge it. And often in the tradition, people were, it was said that they should, you should talk to your spiritual director about this. So there was once a time not so long ago when you had to, you know, when religious, for example, needed the permission of their spiritual director to go to communion frequently. Um, so I think what's happened after Pius, St. Pius X is that communion has become so frequent as to become routine and almost meaningless for a lot of people. And the danger, the more subtle danger, including for Catholics who are very earnest and, and very good people, is to think of the Eucharist as something like, kind of like our property. Like it, we, we, de we deserve to have this and we have to get it. Instead of having the humility to see that, that sometimes it's good for us to, to have a, so to speak, a Eucharistic fast, as Joseph Ratzinger calls it, and to have that longing in us for a deeper sacramental communion really nourished and enkindled. Um, so I guess this is just a way of saying there's a real danger in our time of kind of utilitarianism and pragmatism where we try to reduce the mass to receiving communion and we reduce communion to the most efficient system that we can think of. And this is all wrong because this is not how we should treat our Lord and it's not the way we best prepare ourselves to receive. Janet, any thoughts? Oh, yes. When I when we couldn't go to Mass because of COVID, um, I started watching a Latin Mass in Limerick, Ireland, which was just exquisite. Um, everything was beautiful. Uh, they sing. It was an empty church. There was, in fact, there was just one, one or two nuns at the, at the very front that would do the sitting and standing. But... Um, but, you know, at first I'm, I have it on my, my laptop and I'm sitting in my, in my easy chair and I'm thinking like, there's something wrong, there's something wrong with this. And so I set up a, um, a beautiful, I, I just love a little altar in my, in, 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 in my bedroom in a corner and it's, it's just beautiful. And now it's transformed my prayer. Uh, you know, I have candles, I light them every day, I have icons, I have all sorts of things. It's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm thinking that's one of the best things that's come out of COVID for me is realizing I don't want to pray in my um, recliner. And and um, and honestly, I don't want to watch Mass. I mean, everybody I at the beginning kind of found it kind of interesting to see how the Mass was done in different places. And and then they found out that, as you said, Peter, is is to pick up a missile and pray through the Mass. And and even with children, you have them read different parts of the mass and you may just not read the whole mass or pray the whole mass, but you discuss the different portions of it. 
and right. you, you, you devote an hour or so to this and it just makes such a difference um and it's you know it's poured over into their attending mass that they have a a heightened awareness of what the mass is and why it's so wonderful to have it i mean i think that's something we're going to have to talk about either now or at some other session but you know, we haven't touched much upon preparing for mass um mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I've seen people over the years with, with kids just do great things. Um, and they make the preparation all week long. You know, if they talk about someone having problems, they say, well, let's make that our intention or one of our intentions on Sunday. And, and as they, they talk about mass, they say, what are you going to offer your mass for? And then afterwards, um, you know, what were you moved to pray for after mass during the time of Thanksgiving? And you say, I'd like to pray for that too. So I want to know, and, and all those sorts of things, the fasting, the the, the dressing up, um, the, I had one friends that on Sunday, kids got all dressed up and then they would um, go home and have a very nicely prepared uh, meal. And they had to learn table manners. And once they all reached a certain level, every couple of weeks they'd go out to a restaurant and if, if to show off that they knew my father would, would travel extra hours to visit this family and take them out to dinner because he couldn't believe he's how well mannered the kids are. He said, I can never do it. He said, I can never do it. I don't know how this guy does it, but yeah. they practiced, they practiced at home. So making it something you look forward to all week long um, and uh you know, saying that you're bringing everything to this mass and offering it to the Lord and all the graces that are there. Kids love, they totally love to think that they're helping someone by um, offering uh, the mass and offering prayer for them. So yes. I think that changes everything when you're really um, intentionally preparing all week long. Yes. Yeah. Just, just, just to second that, I mean, children particularly can see when their parents are taking something seriously and and they can pick up very easily that w the difference between a mass that is celebrated with total faith and reverence in the blessed sacrament and a mass where it's kind of about the community or it's about something else some political cause or whatever they can they can sense that they may not be able to put it into words but there's an intuition there and and it it seems to me that a similar uh, something similar can be said about thanksgiving after mass right we haven't even touched on that but i, I make a big point of of urging people to stay after mass, after you receive communion, stay for 15 minutes in the church. It seems like a, a long time when you're not used to it, you know, and you're, and you're busy and you're thinking, oh, I've got to get away. I've got to get, here. and sometimes people really do have to leave right away. I'm not saying that that never happens, but if you can, it's part of, I mean, Pius X says this when he encourages frequent communion, he says that pre preparing adequately and giving thanks afterwards is part of a fruitful communion, right? Um, so I think we really we really need to think carefully about sort of I, how how to put it like all the other things that surround Holy Communion, right? It's not just something isolated by itself. It's part of a whole way of life. It is very well said. Um, there's another question that's a tough one, and I want to uh, throw something out there and get your thoughts. So whenever I talk about this, I get this question, and I and I feel a little bit bad for people. So ordinary form participant, extraordinary minister. They, they listen to this and they go, Oh, my hands aren't consecrated. Oh, I am touching the Lord. I am doing something reserved for the priest historically. Now back to the beginning of, we're not judging that person because usually those people are pretty devout. They really want, they, they have been taught a, a, a what we, you know, what was an unintended interpretation of Pius X's, you know, a, a active participation. And, 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 and so they wanted to help. And they, and so, you know, my, one of the things I've said is, is, well, if you quitting is going to lead to it being done more uh, or less reverently, um, I would struggle with that. Um, so I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I so I, I think I'm in a pretty good position to talk about this because uh, I wrote an article just this past Monday at New Liturgical Movement um, about lay ministries and how lay ministries actually lay liturgical ministries take lay people away from their own proper vocation in the world. Yeah. And they also take the clergy away from their proper vocations. But I started the article by talking about my own experience growing up. I was 
I wanted to be a good Catholic. I think that that was clearly the grace of God working in me in my life. Um, and the only message I ever got was if you're serious about being Catholic, you have to sign up for ministries. You have to sign up and do stuff. That's the mes message I took away. Um, and so I first signed up to be an altar, altar server. I did that for a while. Then when I was a little older, I signed up to be a lector and I did that for a while. And then I signed up to be a, an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. And I did that for not a very long time, maybe about a year. Um, and it was at that point, and see this whole, the problem when I look back on it now is I don't really think I knew what I was doing. I mean, young people typically don't know. This was in high school. I mean, they, they typically, you know, nobody really fully understands the Mass. But I mean, I didn't know that the Mass was the holy sacrifice of Calvary. I didn't really have faith in the real presence. You know, I, it, it was, I was kind of going through the motions to be actively involved because I thought this is how you show that you're a Catholic and that you believe. And when I got involved in the charismatic movement right after that, I stopped doing those things. And the interesting thing for me is that I, di I didn't stop doing them because I had a conversion to the traditional Latin mass. I didn't even know that it existed. It was because the charismatic prayer group took over my life in a way that was so fulfilling and so energizing. Like suddenly I really believe, I mean, it was, I learned how to pray and I learned to be satisfied in praying as a layman and I didn't want to do those those other things anymore. Does that? I, I don't know if that makes any sense. But it was kind of like I found a, a home as a layman just praying. And then later on with the traditional Latin Mass, I realized, oh, that's right. You can be totally fulfilled and satisfied and set on fire just worshiping God. You don't have to volunteer to do anything. I mean, maybe you can sing or maybe you can, you know, help out with, you know, the collection basket or something, but you don't have to be like a mini priest or like a quasi cleric in order to have dignity and value as a layman, you know, and to show your faith. So anyway, that's kind of a little nutshell about how I, you know, my, my own journey on that question. All right. Go ahead, Janet. Do you have any thoughts? Well, just that in the last year, I've become both a sacristan and a Eucharistic minister, which are two total surprises to me. But, um, you know, I, I eventually, I mean, I'm, this notion of a Eucharistic fast is really hard for me to get my head around, um, though I usually end up wherever Peter is eventually. And so even though I'm here now, I, you know, I come back in another year. Uh, I never wanted to be a Eucharistic minister. I only did that because I had a friend who... Um, had um, cancer and uh, wasn't able to go to mass or even get outside for months on end during COVID and nobody would, uh, no priest would take it to her. And so I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll get you the, the blessed sacrament. And so I, I did that. And, and, and as a sacristan, I, you know, I've been so critical of priests uh, in the church uh, recently that I, I sort of wanted to have a way to humbly serve um, uh, the priests and uh, show them that I, I mean, there are so many wonderful, beautiful priests. Uh, Amen, yeah. And I, I didn't, I wanted them to know that, and even I do it at a Novus Ordo Mass, a daily Mass. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't do it for the, the um, TLM. I don't know how long I'll continue doing that. Um, I, I loved reading in Peter's book that it used to be that sacristan wore gloves. And I'm thinking I'm going to start wearing gloves uh, when I handle the the chalice and the patent, and I take these things out to the altar, and when I, I take them back, uh, that seems right to me. Uh, I think I'll start dressing a little better uh, for daily mass, you know, that 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 sort of thing. I, I, I mean, I really think I've been a tremendously malformed liturgically, and what, what I'm what I'm learning from, uh, you know, reading this book is kind of an examination of conscience. You know, it's like, um, do I have the proper uh, uh, reverence uh, towards the Eucharist? Have I started uh, acquiring a kind of a casual, uh, you know, I, you know, we all, I mean, I don't know if we all did, but you know, when I was again at Notre Dame, you would have these student retreats, you know, and you're all sitting on the floor during the Eucharist, you know, and the one of the, someone else is making the Eucharistic bread. Um, and I remember that was one of my huge crises at Notre Dame. I was asked to go to a, a retreat and I knew the, the other faculty member had made the Eucharistic bread. <laughs> it wasn't unleavened. And, you know, I'm sort of going to, you know, and, Anyway, that kind of thing, I had so many crises where, again, I decided I didn't want to know because it was just so traumatic for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the answers you got to your questions were worse than anything you can imagine. You know, 
you know, it says that the, the, it, it, does, it says it has to be unleavened bread, but it, it, it doesn't say it can't be leavened bread. That's the answer I got. You go, like, wait a second. It's yeah, so that's, not, that's not right. No. It, 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 I mean, the principle of non-contradiction does not hold in these situations with these people. And, and that really always causes me huge cognitive problems. And so anyway, I would I, I plead guilty uh, to many of the um, attitudes, uh, both thinking and in my behavior uh, towards the Eucharist. And I am finding that, again, going to the Latin Mass and reading Peter's stuff just is, again, it's transformative. You sort of sit there and you say, oh, well, then I have to change. I have to do this. And because I've acquired all of these attitudes and habits. Yeah. Yeah, so I, let me uh, add one la one last thing to that. I, as I told you, I do not like universal uh, spiritual prescriptions. I, I don't think it, it, they drive me a little crazy and, and can be shallow. But I will say this: we're 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 uh, Lent is not that far away, and as we conclude our conversation with these two uh, really incredible people. Um, who love the Lord and love the church and have given you know so much of their life to to bring greater life to, to everyone who who desires God I would strongly recommend that no matter who you are Latin mass ordinary form that you buy this book uh, the holy bread of eternal life and that you make this year a different year you participate in the in the uh, novena and you, you purpose, whether you're in the ordinary form, and in, in our community, we have, you know, thousands of people, 44 countries, a lot of diversity, charismatics, traditionalists. I tell them, be faithful in your tradition, you know, be faithful. So if you're an ordinary form person, read this book. If you're in the Latin mass, read this book, uh, read the general instruction of the, of the Roman Missal, read Memoriali Domini. Begin to dive into this uh, reality of what it means to encounter God because, as we've talked about here, there is no more important thing in our life. So it is beyond irresponsible, if I could be very direct, to not, to not dig into it. And there are reason, many reasons, you know, Janet talked about just trying to stay out of trouble. I get all of that. But, but I would just say it's time for all of us to dig deeper and to begin to make reparation because I believe with all of my heart that the decline in the United States, as an example, of course, the, the, the sin of abortion and contraception, these grave sins uh, of intrinsic evils just committed day in and day out are, are a blight on our nation and are, de and are causing an, a, an internal deterioration of epic proportions. But I do believe also that our lack of attentiveness to the Lord, our lack of respect for the Lord, desecration that occurs because we're approaching him in a state of mortal sin. All of these things are essential, are vital to be remedied and to be made reparation for. If we're to see, if we're going to have any hope for revival. I, I, be, I It sounds trite, but I believe uh, Father Z when he says, you know, save the liturgy, save the world. I mean, I, because... What we're saying by that is when we are properly oriented to God, the, the likelihood we become holy is dramatically higher. And when you're changed by an encounter with God, then the world changes around you. That when you're an authentic disciple of Jesus, you are changed and the world changes around you. So this year, I think, is the year, and, and I'm making the commitment. You know, I, I've, I reviewed the book before it came out. I'm going to read it again. I told Peter I would read it again. You know, devotionally, I'm going to participate in this novena, and I'm going to make it a year, and it's going to be part of my Lenten discipline to go deeper in my worship and understanding of what it means to encounter God in the Eucharist. Amen. I, I couldn't possibly say it better. Thank you, Dan. Well, it's been a blessing being with you guys. As I said, it's far too short a time but we do need to wrap up, wrap it up. Um, everybody go out and get the Holy Bread of Eternal Life. Janet, you want to mention one more time where folks can, you said you were doing some 
teaching on Latin and that sort of thing? What what's yeah, your, it's, it's an evolving project. It's a it's at a primitive stage, but it's on my I've got a website called JanetSmith.org. It's got a lot of my contraception, why not stuff, but it also has a Latin page where I'm trying to help people understand the Latin mass. And I want to agree with you about the silence of the mass. And I, I tell people when they're first going to the Latin mass, treat it more as adoration than what they've experienced in the Novus Ordo. Because, you know, they want to sit and stand and sing and this and that and that. And you don't do that. And I want to say, just enter into a profound, receptive peace. That's what the, the goal is. And whatever prayer strikes you as being <clears throat> something that really deserves your meditation, stick with that. And don't, as you said, don't try to follow. That will drive you crazy. So, you know, watch what's going on and get a sense of the reverence and the movement and what's happening. But don't fuss about following everything. Last thing I'll say, and then I'll give Peter the last word. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the Septuagesima pre-Lent, preparing for Lent webinar, January 25th. It's at spiritualdirection.com forward slash events. Peter, that's tomorrow. I'm Yeah, that's true. I'm giving that tomorrow. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thanks for the producer's like the conversion of St. Paul. So, yeah. so here's my, here's my comment. You know, my, my confirmation name was Paul. Um, because when I was confirmed, I, I wanted to pick a, I was impressed with St. Paul, with his fervor, with his zeal, with his humility as someone who converted from, from Pharisaism to Catholicism, if I can put it that way. Um, and I, and I still love St. Paul and the, the conversion of St. Paul, which we celebrate tomorrow, reminds us that we all need deeper conversion. I mean, this is this is something that Dan, with with your emphasis on on mysticism, on the mystical way, the mystical and ascetical life, you you know this. This is a fundamental truth. We all need deeper conversion, no matter where we are, um, and whatever we do to love the Lord more in the Holy Eucharist and to prepare ourselves more for receiving Him and to give thanks for this gift is going to benefit the whole church. Amen. What every member of the mystical body does or suffers benefits every other member of the mystical body. We need to keep that in mind. We need to have that supernatural perspective. Amen. All right. Thank you both again for all the great work you're doing in the church. Yeah, that's uh, great. It's been a blessing spending some time with you. And uh, well, I, I hope we can do it again and, and keep digging deeper. Uh, in the meantime, folks, holy the holy bread of eternal life, restoring Eucharistic reverence in an age in, in, of impiety. Please join us uh, for the novena uh, for Eucharistic penance to make reparation for the sins against the Lord and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Go to EucharisticPenance.com, and if you're signed up there, you'll get this video. God bless you guys. Thanks, and take Thank care. You. God bless. God bless.